Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. And I'm Jenna. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. We've made it, guys. Made it! Yay! Last episode. champagne! <laughs> Last episode <laughs> of the first season. I'm never Miami- talking to you guys again. <laughs> <laughs> Season 1, episode 23, titled Lombard. It originally premiered on May 10th, 1985. It was directed by John Nicolella. Nicolella? A routine vice director. He did The Milk Run and many more episodes that are coming down the line. The episode was written by Joel Cernow, who is also a Miami Vice staple. He wrote Cool Running, Calderon's Return, both one and two, The Great McCarthy, Little Prince, Meet for Each Other. He's got another episode coming up, Out Where the Buses Don't Run. So this is got the best of the best vice hands all over it fitting for a season finale before we get started like checking in and see what's going on in each other's lives and guys there was something unbearable happened this week the end is nigh all right <laughs> and let me tell you I i'm know, not man. living I hate through storms. this like there's no way that i survive there may have been <laughs> some question before okay wait so we need to back up just for oh, like okay, a second hold on hold on, hold on. So what are you guys talking about? What happened? (laughs) Uh, You're not talking about the big thunderstorm that rolled through? (laughs) In case you, like John, have just like somehow mastered a way to not be completely dependent on the internet, the internet went down. Like how? And that's like capital I internet because everyone came running to me. Just I guess some background is that I do uh, just think of me like IT uh, type support, Uh, not in IT though. But everyone came running to me to fix the internet, and I didn't realize, because I've never had to say, like, the internet's down, and it's not just that our Wi-Fi network is down. Like, (laughs) the entire internet is down. (laughs) I don't even know the guys who run that shit, so. I honestly didn't even notice. I mean, I couldn't get... I didn't even know, like, until I got home that night, and I'm on the internet, and I'm like, I wonder what all these people are talking about. Like, did someone accidentally hit the switch? Which did they actually <laughs> turn it off? <laughs> for for the mega nerds out there who follow this kind of stuff, like me, this they unplugged is... it. They, they, they were there was a guy vacuuming. He chipped over the cord, and the internet got <laughs> unplugged for like ten minutes. For me, I, I am fascinated with this story and how the Internet of Things and the future that it plays on the general internet. And our coffee you know, makers are gonna kill us. <laughs> now see i laugh at the politicians reaction to this because they're like we're so unprepared and unprotected we gotta protect the internet because the u.s owns the internet <laughs> so it's like like we gotta build a fence around it <laughs> for the like, record that's their response <laughs> for the record in case anyone listening or people with the podcast who are wondering it was a ddos attack on a dns server this is not hacking This is not, and the internet didn't actually go down. The only thing that went down was the phone book of certain of a group of websites for how when you put in, say, google.com, that it it understands that when you say Google, you actually mean a specific IP address. Hey, so if I understand this correctly, and I mean, I'm probably way wrong, but from what I I understand all they did is just send them a bunch of like erectile dysfunction ads and it just jammed <laughs> up the server. Like, isn't that pretty much what that attack is? Is they just really just cram everything up so everything moves like super slow? They, yeah, exactly. So, John, I'll explain it in terms that you'll understand. The shitter was clogged. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get to this episode. <laughs> yeah, let's get over and talk about this episode. All right, so we have, from beginning to end, in my opinion on this, is like this this episode played very much like a traditional movie, actually. More like the pilot than it was a what we got accustomed to with the regular Miami Vice episodes. We open up on Al Lombard's boat. Right out of the gate, we're there with Al Lombard, and he's there with his son, Sal. And they're actually having like it, a pr- pretty traditional son-father-teenage-type conversation. Does it make sense to say that this is probably the Miami Vice-iest Vice episode? <laughs> <laughs> like, is that a 
Can that be a thing? Yeah, well, I don't know how to judge a Miami Vice episode now because we have the pilot, we have this, we have made for each other, we have cool running. Like, what? what is a Miami Vice episode? I don't even know anymore. It's where they sneak onto a guy's boat to se- to serve him a subpoena. Like, that was just goofy to begin with. So they sneak on Al and Sal. Al and Sal are having a <laughs> conversation. And Sal's, Al's trying to ask him about how things are going, how his car was, how his mom is, and his son's just being a total douche. And He's uh, mad because his son wants to go into English lit, mm-hmm, not mm-hmm. law. But his dad's right. His dad's right. You can't make any with an English lit degree, <laughs> you're, basically you're a, you're a K through twelve teacher. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, there it... are other notable professions. You could end up working in middle management or HR. <laughs> <laughs> Aim high, aiming high for middle management. <laughs> Don't make fun of my life, John. Okay. <laughs> well, John, you're right. Tubbs and Crockett and another police officer and then another agent all sneak on top of Lombard's boat and they're there to serve him a subpoena to appear before the grand jury. He's got they want him to testify someone the name of Labrici and they say like we're subpoenaing you and we're giving you immunity so if you plead the fifth you're gonna go to jail you can't plead plead the fifth because you can't be incriminated so if you don't testify you're gonna be held in contempt and you're gonna go to jail for five years if you do testify we're gonna try and protect you but Labrici is probably gonna kill you I just want to point out that five years throughout the beginning of this episode, they keep saying, but he's going to get five years if he doesn't testify. I feel like five years back then must have felt like a hell of a lot longer than it does today. <laughs> because in it's today's not even one correctional political cycle. system, five years will get you like a year and three months in actual jail nowadays. And then you just mm-hmm. do the rest in probation. I feel like that's not a big threat. Yeah, it didn't days. seem like it was that long either. Although the threat is out there is that once he goes, he's not going to be safe in jail. So if Labrici or anyone else might still would be able to get to him in there. The scene ends with Crockett just as all the agent finishes explaining to Lombard, like, hey, look, here's your deal. Like, you're backed into a corner. Tubbs and the other officer leaves and Sonny just stays there, finishes smoking his cigarette right there on Al's boat. He just makes himself comfortable. I mean, like, yeah, they're old friends kind of now. Rude, man. I mean, I, I mean, Lombard doesn't smoke in your house. <laughs> he only kills your former lovers. <laughs> <laughs> and then after a couple minutes, Sonny finally puts out his smoke and then he leaves and that and we roll to the opening credits. When we come back from the opening credits, we're back at Lombard's boat and Al this time is meeting with one of his people, Charlie, who you may recognize. Uh, Yeah, because it's Michael Mann's other favorite person in the world, John Santucci. It's like if Michael Mann could create a package that he delivered to everyone, it would be Dennis Farina and John Santucci <laughs> just wrapped together. I feel like and they probably you. never left. Like they <laughs> yeah. were just still on set. It's they, like, well, if you guys are still here. <laughs> they literally only stopped showing up on Miami Vice because after making this episode, they officially launched into doing Crime Story. John Santucci <laughs> and Dennis Farina together with Michael Mann. The three of them just <laughs> moved over to do another show and then they come back in season five. <laughs> This conversation between Lombard and Charlie is there's a new person in charge of the Labrici family. It's the son of the uh, the patriarch. The kid, he's young, but he's aggressive. Al's talking about things aren't the way that they used to be. Me and his old, I worked for his old man. We we went way back, and he's asking Charlie to go talk to this kid, explain to the Labrici kid that he's an all right dude. And of course, Charlie says. Yeah, boss, I gotcha. And so after Charlie says he's going to go talk to Labrici, we jump over to the precinct. Castillo was talking to Sonny and Rico about Lombard. He's assigning the B team to go monitor Lombard, and they're worried. The reason why they're going to monitor him all the time now is because they're worried that Labrici is either going to try and kill him or Lombard is going to try and ex- try and flee the country. So they have to monitor him 24 hours a day. And I feel like this conversation with Castillo is having with Sonny and Crockett is less Breachy's going to kill him and more, please don't let this one get killed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's like, a pretty it very good... much feels, it feels like he's telling him, don't let this witness die too. Don't fuck up again, guys, please. <laughs> 
I mean, it seems pretty consistent because even when they talk more with Lombard later and they're like giving him the, you know, you either stick with us or you're or you're a dead man. And Lombard's essentially like, uh, no, <laughs> I'm going to need to stay as far away from you guys as possible because I want a chance at living. <laughs> like they, they have a reputation. After we leave the precinct, we go to probably my favorite scene of this episode. Well, uh, uh, sorry, I have other favorite scenes because of the serious dance, but this is my this is my favorite scene because it's funny. We go to an ice cream shop, and at this ice cream shop, we meet Charlie is meeting with Frederico Labrici. I'm just gonna call him Fred. Fred is a young he's he's a young guy. He's wearing a nice suit. He's overly Italian. Charlie is there to try and convince him. That Al is that Lombard is an okay guy, although Charlie is not trying very hard to do that. Uh, I beg to differ because those shakes look delicious. <laughs> I only Are ever you saying want to discuss Charlie's business. milkshake brings all the boys to the yard. <laughs> <laughs> And what comes in this conversation is Fred eventually says, Al's done. He's got to go. He's He's been backed into a corner. Hey, Charlie, do you think you can handle Al's section of the business? And of course, Charlie's like, hell yeah, I can. I can make that kind of money. And before we cut away in the scene, a nice mustachioed man comes up and stares at the two for about 30 seconds and then just walks away and we have no idea why that happens or who he is we find out later that he's one of fred rico's bodyguards but at the time he just kind of walks up and stares at him and then he walks away and he's then we end the scene he's just a pissed off ice cream vendor <laughs> So what I did want to spend a little bit of time on talking about in this scene isn't necessarily the impact this scene has, although it has a big impact because Charlie is going to, he's going to kneecap Lombard to take his place within the Labrici business. But I also wanted to talk about what is with the vice writers and when someone is supposed to be quote unquote young, they, they make them look like they're a child. So they talk about early in the episode, I was on the boat before the last precinct scene he says that oh the new kid has taken over the labrici family business like yeah he's really young well then the next scene when you introduce Le- labrici you have him getting malts at an ice cream parlor yeah dude i know and, and it's it's weird because they they're constantly trying to inject youth into it and i think it's because they want to appeal to the younger audience as well but i just i don't feel like like making the mob boss go for ice cream is the way to do this. I just don't think they know how to manage making someone look young. They make them look so young. So in Nobody Lives Forever, right? Those those guys are supposed to be young. What do they have them do? Every scene they talk about, it's like, oh, we found comic books. And then they're at the restaurant and they're like smashing food together and making crude jokes. They take people who are supposed to be quote unquote young and make them act like 10 year olds. Yeah, dude, I feel like it's, it's like you're when your parents try and be cool you know (laughs) that's the vice writers like they're your parents trying to be cool for the youth but they have no idea what's cool so they end up just looking really old and awkward or they make them look overly young like why why would they have him come like they're going to introduce the kid who's now running one of the most powerful mob families in Miami. We're going to let's go meet Frederico Labrici. Everyone's afraid of him. He's out getting Sundays with, with one of his <laughs> business partners. Oh, dude. And it's worse than that. The song they're playing in the ice cream parlor is entitled My Boy Lollipop. <laughs> yeah. It is, they're, they're basically singing Lollipop, Lollipop. Oh, lolly lollipop. I mean, basically, just a different 50s version of that song. I don't know. I don't know what to deal with with that. So Hi. when we leave from the from the malt sharing between Labrici and one of his cronies, we go to... The only a... way it would have been better is if they were both sharing one with two straws <laughs> in it. I mean, they technically were, considering that Fabrizi doesn't take a sip or anything from his own. He dips his pinky into Charlie's. And, yeah. like, makes awkward eye contact as he licks it off of his finger before standing up. I don't know if that's some sort of, like, well, he tactic use... to be intimidating or, like, a come on. But, like, it kind of works in both regards. I don't know what's going on because, yeah, he does that. He sticks his finger in Charlie's milkshake. Yeah. And then the mustache bodyguard comes up and stares at him. <laughs> 
and then the scene ends like that's it that's that's the end of the ice cream scene you got a pretty mouth <laughs> dude not cool not cool man <laughs> you didn't even wash them <laughs> When we leave from the ice cream shop, we go to a stakeout with the B team who's watching Lombard. He's at a hotel with one of his ladies. As Zito recognizes her, that's someone that they've arrested before. Uh, so he's with a prostitute. But in reality, the thing that we really want to talk about in this scene is Zito watching Switek eat a hot dog. <laughs> and apparently, hot dogs are low in cholesterol. <laughs> I, uh... Because when he, because Switek says in, in the scene that, hey, I'm watching my cholesterol as he's munching down this hot dog. On a side note, that hooker has a hell of a nice house. <laughs> damn good at being a hooker. I just want to throw that out there, man. She she's she's making money. This week in Stan and Larry, things clearly aren't getting any better. Like <laughs> It's tense. One points out the other's male pattern baldness. One points out the other's <laughs> willingness to eat questionable foods. <laughs> Wait, Zito says that he tells Artex like you're a machine. <laughs> <laughs> and then he like painstakingly goes through the detail of just how he's a machine. Like, let me tell you all the ways the things that I've noticed about you as I've considered this comparison. <laughs> like what the hot dog is your is your fuel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He goes into this long description. Eventually they see what they see is that Lombard saying goodbye to his hooker and then gets in the car and leaves and the b team tails him back to his boat by the next morning the b team is still hanging out there although they're in a convertible with cameras and binoculars just down the street from the boat so i doubt people are unaware of what zito and Switek are up to but Can they just see ask- in fact that well in, in fact they're so aware that even when they uh, they tail him to lunch even makes a comment about they got a little guy under the table taking notes. Why do dangerous, powerful men always ho- meet up with hookers? I don't know. I don't like, know wouldn't what it that be is. More, like you're more powerful and more alluring when you don't have to pay for sex? Or at least the hookers come to you. Right. 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 I mean, we, we never see Mrs. Lombard. Like, I guess like, I always I just envision that. I think it's a status symbol. I think the nicer house your hooker lives in, <laughs> the higher up on the food chain you are. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Okay, anyway, not to get us too far off track. So then they show up at this place for lunch or whatever that you guys are talking about, and Stan and Larry can't get in. They're and, not dressed appropriately because their pants, their shorts aren't on brand. And Lombard's there having a discussion with some business partners. It's a short meeting. He, Like John said, he jokes about people listening to him all over the place. He's making some jokes about he's one, making a deal with anyone and everyone. And so when lunch is done and they go to leave, true assassins are waiting for him outside of the restaurant including one, one badass woman yeah with a gigantic gun dude look at her go yeah <laughs> so so this excited. is the part this is the part uh, i wanted to get to because this this scene to me is hilarious it starts out with them popping out and lombard pushes the two guys he's having the meeting with out in front of him as yeah. like a shield <laughs> yeah. and then and then the firefight ensues one of the shooters gets taken out and the girl just books it man like she's fast sprinter. Too. yeah she's gone yeah, she's gone little so, do we know and, it's actually trini <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> and we see that Lombard gets hit, which I guess kind of gets played off later in the episode. But the very end of the scene, we see the B team hiding behind like a plant with like a fountain. Like they don't want to be a part of any of this. Stan and Larry, come on, guys. This was your job. Your job wasn't to tail him just to see what he's up to. Your job was to protect him. You need. You were yeah, assigned. This was to... their moment. Yeah, they're protecting this was their each moment other. To be like the hero cops. They were supposed Instead, to. Instead, they're sure... hiding behind a plant. Yeah, it turns out it was better that they didn't get into the restaurant because they should have been patrolling outside to see who was out there. They're never going to be able to adopt if they don't stay safe, okay? (laughs) It's a very rigorous process to get those kids from, I don't know where, Haiti? Maybe there was a hot dog vendor out front. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, there's not even a maybe about that. We've made it through enough episodes to know that there's definitely a hot dog vendor out front. And maybe that hot dog vendor was given them the tip that is true so in the last moments we see lombard's been hit none of his bodyguards have been hit but one of the assassins has been shot lombard's alive 
we find out later that he was wearing a bulletproof vest. He was just hitting the shoulder of the B team, arrest the bodyguards, and get an ambulance. We have a brief stopover when we leave from here at a warehouse where Tubbs and Crockett are looking into a warehouse that's been burned down. And it's one of Labrici's warehouses. So now we're in full-on war mode. The Labrici's versus the Lombards. And I feel like with the way everything is escalated, that the vice team should just subpoena all of this guy's lieutenant. Yeah. And then just let Labrici just handle it. Apparently, if you even just make the insinuation that there's a possibility he might testify... He'll just wipe you out. So it, it it escalates really fast. We went from Lombard has gotten a subpoena before, to appear before the grand jury to try to murder him. And then Lombard retaliates and burns down one of Labrici's warehouses. So jump to the hospital. Well, Lombard's we have, doing great. We have one other stopover before we get there. We have a stopover at the dog track where Tubbs and Crockett go and talk to Augie. And just tell him, give us any information if you hear anything. The scene ends up meaning nothing throughout the entire episode. Well, he does tell them that Lombard's like a pariah, that people are mm-hmm. fast exiting their association with him. But, I mean, it turns out Izzy could have probably gotten him more information than Augie did. Oh, true. Then we go to the hospital, Jenna. And like you're saying, Lombard seems like he's doing just fine. He's walking around. Yeah, he's practically toe-tapping his way down the hall, spinning a cane. <laughs> so he's like yelling at advice. a couple of his people and tells them like you i only asked you guys to take care of me you can't even do that shit get out of here and then the vice team shows up and the vice team goes hey you know we can protect you and he and, and he's <laughs> well, like no what? no you can't and the vice team's like no oh, you're probably right we can't <laughs> <laughs> Scene. Well, sorry, but, but we before get we to... leave from there, I do want to point out I, I love it when Crockett, I love it when Crockett attacks someone like he's trying to be rude to people because before he leaves, as the vice team is leaving, Charlie comes in with some flowers for Lombard, which is ironic, right? Because we know that Charlie's trying to try and undercut Lombard, and Crockett stops, smells one of the flowers in, in Charlie's bouquet, and goes, Ugh, and then leaves. <laughs> 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 Ouch, Crockett. I mean, you could have called him fat. You could have called him stupid. But you like these point out that his flowers stink that he brought to his boss. Like, I think you Charlie's Charlie deep, flowers. Man. Like, how is that an insult? <laughs> Which like is Charlie's exact reaction. He kind of shrugs and looks at Crockett like, what the what the hell are you doing? Like, what is this? As he's walking out. So, so we get to the next scene. And they've got Labrazzi's creepy bodyguard who stares. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dude, so, and, so, so one second, one second, just to make sure that we cover that, that we're there. Al immediately tells Charlie, like, get down to the car. We have business to take care of. We have one brief stop over at the precinct where Cassio just wants an update and the vice team is telling him. Lombard's refusing to work with us, and Cassio's saying, just stick with it. Eventually, all of his people are going to abandon him, and he's, he's only got two things that he can do. He can testify, or he can try and flee the country. Either way, if all his people are leaving him, he's probably a dead man. More than likely, he's going to cooperate with us. And then we go to the garage and Lombard making an example out of somebody. So they, they've they got the bodyguard, the creepy one from the ice cream parlor, and they're being tough on them. And it, when the f- scene first started, what flashed <laughs> in my head is is the bodyguard being like, no habla uh, English, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, but we get, it gets even better because we, we get uh, Lombard threatening him by saying, uh, we're going to kill you the old fashioned way. And then they shoot him. So yeah. apparently the old-fashioned way is shooting him, <laughs> which makes me wonder, what's the new way? Do they have lasers? <laughs> Do they have something? See- like, what's the new way of killing uh, of killing him then? You know, yeah. shooting's the old way. Like, like, I was expecting something like old-school mafia, like, you know, they drag him with the car or something, you know. Or- All of a sudden, three pigs <laughs> show up. You know, <laughs> yeah, but they just shoot him. So it's like, uh, well, what's the new way? Do you guys carry samurai swords? Like, what's the cool thing now? <laughs> he asked him, like, who set me up? And the bodyguard just stares right at Charlie and says, "You should ask him." And you see the look on Charlie's face, like, "Oh, fuck!" Then, then yeah, yeah the bodyguard like- is like still too dumb to truly pick up on it. The episode could be over at this point because right. we just we just solved the mystery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and then they do they they do the old fashioned way. Like, I thought for sure what the old fashioned way was going to be that they were going to beat him to death, little mini baseball bats or something like that. 
But no, they just shoot mm-hmm. him right there in the parking garage, and then they all leave. Lombard, I think it's clear that Lombard knows that Charlie's playing both sides, and that this was a message to Charlie, like, remember, you work for me. And he tells Charlie, I want you to set up Labrici. You work for me, remember... You need to go set him up for me. And we leave from the garage and we go back to Lombard's boat. Lombard's there alone. He calls Lombard and tells him, like, hey, all this stuff has been set up with with Labrici, but it didn't go as planned. It's time for you to get out of the country. Come meet me at the building uh, underneath the bridge. I'll have all of your papers ready to go for you. In the meantime, the vice team gets a call on the on the Ferrari car phones, like, hey, Lombard's on the move. And so they race over to Lombard's boat and catch him just as he's leaving with his bags to go meet with Charlie. And we have a nut. We have our our only montage of the episode. Couldn't get out without at least one. Real quick, at the end of this scene, it gets really weird. They're they're him and Tub, Crockett and Tubbs are trying to use like a they're using accents or something or. Yeah, but right right before Lombard's car takes off and they go to tail him, they're like talking in British accents. Yeah, that, that, I, I was so confused. Like, why? Like, what the hell is that about? I don't know. And they very quickly lose Lombard, too, as, across, as Lombard's racing across the very, very empty Miami freeways. They lose him really fast. And the driving montage lasts just long enough for us to hear the entire U2 song that plays during the montage. Yeah, They're also yeah, driving at, like, dude. warp speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they are, they're tailing the guys. They get down to, what is that? Is it, like, a shipyard or something? I think what he was saying is that it's a building that they are, that's under construction for them that's underneath a bridge. I, I don't know. There was definitely construction going on, but it just looked like they were standing underneath a bridge. Right. I feel like Lombard, when he's coming into this meeting, he should just kind of feel like something's going wrong, because I think it's pretty obvious. It takes him way the hell out. I mean, if the driving montage is any indication, we're in Vermont at this point. <laughs> 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 like i feel like he should be expecting charlie's betrayal a little more than he than he does right. exactly and so charlie and the bodyguards that are there with them both pull all oh, they all pull out guns on al al looks like he's surprised and at the last second before charlie's able to pull the trigger kill lombard and take his place in the lavrici family crockett is able to fire a fantastic shot from the overpass met really far away and kill charlie and Tubbs just yells out miami vice and the bodyguards just immediately drop their guns and put their hands up yeah i did not understand <laughs> oh my god their guns work <laughs> <laughs> they caught us I've never used this thing. Not before. just the fact that Miami Vice, they're so like I said, they're probably in Vermont at this point. You don't have <laughs> jurisdiction here. Get out of here. <laughs> Vice cops. I mean, it is a great shot by Sunny. He takes out Charlie. The bodyguards immediately give up, and we have a very eighties ending to this scene where freeze frames on Al's face as he's still there in shock, seeing that the Vice team are the ones that saved his life. And we would normally go to commercial but thankfully we don't live in that world anymore so they so call we, castillo to give him an update and they don't know what to do with them they eventually settle on taking them to a protective house which i have a question they're taking them to this to this protective house it's like a series of studio hotel or like bungalows or something why do protective houses only exist hold, in like the worst part of miami hold on before we get to this i actually have a note on that as well before we get to that when they call castillo it almost sounds like he's doing like a dirty hairy impression it's is it, mm. Was it just my audio, or did it <laughs> seem like he, his voice was extremely low and gravelly for for that phone call? Oh yeah, no, like, you're not alone. I thought like I I specifically noted that it feels like he's trying really hard to speak lower and slower than normal, which is a real feat for him. <laughs> <laughs> Castillo getting ready to break into that ASMR network. <laughs> yeah so then yeah. we go to, so like hey, okay that- like we, we, we go to these protective houses and they like they bust in the vice team comes full force there's police officers they bust into a bunch of houses clear them out there's a helicopter escort they they're bringing out of this house it's in like one of the worst areas of miami so i fail to see how this is a protective house if regular crime is happening in every direction from one of these houses my it, well my take on it is a little di- it's similar but a little different so we start before they come rolling in. We start with Castillo saying that we need to take him to a super, super secret location. 
Mm-hmm. No one can know about this. <laughs> it, and then they roll the out with about 50 people, people, 12 cop cars, and a helicopter <laughs> to the cheapest motel they could find. <laughs> and it's like, like, like sirens on. And it's like, everyone, super secret. <laughs> no helicopter. one can know we're here. <laughs> Bring the helicopter around. I'm pretty sure all of Miami knows Lombard's there at this point. I don't so know they why. Would it be hard there. to follow they the helicopter? Out. They're hanging out. They play blackjack, meaning to play poker, and eat some Italian food with bad ingredients. That pretty much sums it up, right? And then yeah, you get a my specific note. My, my specific note is, I make you a the meatball. <laughs> <laughs> The only thing that stood out to me in this beginning scene where they're in the house, because Tubbs and Crockett are there watching Lombard in the house, is that Lombard Lombard immediately starts to do what he's best at, which is he starts to manipulate Tubbs and Crockett into liking him. You know, at this point, we the whole episode, Crockett has been, he refuses to do anything with Lombard. He constantly makes remarks whenever he's around that he would just let him get killed. But Lombard does what he does best, which is manipulate people into what he wants them to do. So he makes Tubbs and Crockett a meal. They play some cards. They ask each other questions about their lives. Like, And then, of course, the duo starts to lighten up, which comes around to haunt them the next morning when they take Lombard out for a little stretching. And we get a quick scene before they bring him outside of the B team on the roof. And my question is, is... Should the B team be the ones trusted with the AK 47s? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of feel like this was poor plan. I just couldn't help but notice that they they were in the perfect position that if if they both laid back down again, they'd be spooning. <laughs> <laughs> So they've clearly made up. Next morning, Tubbs is doing some yoga against the wall. Lombard says, hey, I want to go out and get some fresh air. And so they escort him out, get some fresh air. All of the vice team is still stationed around watching him as he goes out to stretch. And within just a few minutes, you can tell on Lombard's face, he's looking around to see if any, if anyone else around like, oh, okay, something's up here. Within just a few minutes of him being outside, a moving truck co- pulls up where the, the police have the road blocked and shoot two police officers and then ran through the cars which it feels like they didn't need to shoot those officers they could have just rammed through the cars instead of slowing down and then like, it's, it's, it's like they slowed down and say and fuck these two cops in particular and they drove through <laughs> the blockade in a massive shootout yeah. against and at first i thought it hey, was hey at, that's that fucker that wrote me a ticket the other day <laughs> <laughs> slow down guys <laughs> so yeah they just dude the it mo- turns into a war zone quick too yeah exactly that's exactly what happens it's like bullets are flying everywhere lombard runs back into the house to die for protection and at first i thought this was Labrici's men who are going to try and kill because of the helicopter escort lombard had to his super secret hideout but once they get the moving truck stopped after a massive shootout they can't find lombard Lombard escaped through the back of the house and he's gone. Might stop for a second and give a golf clap to the Miami Vice team who has now lost Lombard twice in this episode. (laughs) But he's still (laughs) alive. (laughs) Let's be honest, though. When they're at the hospital, they kind of told him, yeah, you're right. We can't really protect you. So, I mean, I kind of feel like everyone kind of knew this was going to happen coming into this. It was just a matter of like, how are we going to lose you? So I just want to point out, just want to point out really fast where it comes to how successful the Vice team is being in this, in protecting Al Lombard. First, the B team almost lets him get murdered. Then the duo was supposed to tail him to his, to his meet, which they end up saving him at the last minute, but they do lose him. And then they put him into protective custody and they lose him again. At what point in time does Castillo say, like, look, 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 guys, guys, we got to turn this over to a different department. Clearly, there needs to be some more training w- b- between us. How about we go on a short retreat and we catch up and make sure everyone's on the same page and turn this Lombard case over to a different department? Okay, but how are they going to need We need a me? weekend of doing trust falls. That's, <laughs> I, I think that's what we need. So far... Even like the DEA and the IRS and the (laughs) FBI are reaching out to the vice squad. So think of how just how bad the rest of our law enforcement needs to be in this world 
for the vice team to be like the ones that you go to. <laughs> true. Very true. <laughs> we need your help. Do you? <laughs> well, I, after Lombard escapes, we we have a brief stopover at the precinct for the B team and the duo are telling Castile, like, we don't know where he went. He didn't check in at Labrici's. We can't find him anywhere. But he the duo th- even leave a note. <laughs> but Tubbs and Crockett think that they know because they start thinking like who else would be around and we find out. Well, we found out when they were at the safe house and they were talking to Lombard that night that Lombard has a unique relationship with his son. Even though he cares about him, they never really click. And he, you know, he still wants what's best for his son. And that's where it clicks with Tubbs and Crockett. It's like, oh, he's probably going to go, he's going to go talk to his son, which is exactly what Lombard is doing. We quickly and, jump from the precinct to like a high school track. Maybe they're walking around. Yeah. And this is where I want to just briefly throw out my problem with the episode so far. How come at no point has his son been kidnapped by Labrizi or like, hey, you testify, we're going to kill your son? How come no one cares about the safety of his son? And like, is there some kind of honor code among mobsters? They'll kill him over worrying about five years in prison. But at no point does anyone threaten his son or like, like, I just, I just don't get how that gets left out of the plot here. I don't know. But this scene at the track is, is pretty heartfelt, actually. Lombard is there meeting with Sal and his son is telling him like dad you were never around you never treated me right this is why we've had a bad relationship (laughs) but then his son eventually says like but I want you to testify because I want you to be around I want you to be my dad again and Lombard agrees they hug the duo comes walking up from behind them because they figured out where they would be somehow. And Sal has effectively convinced his father to go testify against Labrici, which is almost signing his death sentence. Well, I guess he's a dead man already. But before they go to their court appearance, they decided not to stash Lombard at his house, but instead on Sonny's boat way out in the middle of the ocean. So I kind of feel like they should have did done this to begin with. Yeah. Like, maybe, maybe that would have been a smart move. Especially... I just point out that halfway through the boat scene, they're, like, hanging out and partying. Like, at, at some point, they picked up Artie and his... I, I guess that's his hooker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, at some point, it, you know, it becomes Crockett's party boat. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I would say, first of all, the boat... They, you're right. They should have done this a long time ago because the boat's clearly safer because Elvis is on the boat. They have, like, a guard dog there to help protect Lumber. I don't know why they didn't think of this before. Yeah, but we also haven't seen Elvis move since, like, <laughs> <laughs> like episode two. So. And then also with that dinner, it's it's because he's going to go into witness protection program and he was signing off his will like where he was not say will, but the document where he'd be gi- giving away all of his assets that way they're not in his control anymore. He after he's like having a dinner with his people before he's going to go disappear forever. Like he's not going to see Augie or his hooker or whoever the other person was that was there at the dinner. But you see on Lombard's face at the dinner, like, Oh man, I'm really going to miss this. I really enjoy this life. It's almost like he's having second thoughts. And this is also when Crockett finally comes clean about calling out Lombard about Carol. And Lombard doesn't even remember her. I want to point out, he sp- Crockett specifically says he doesn't murder people, which I'm calling shenanigans on <laughs> right now. Um, I have personally seen Crockett murder at least 10 people throughout this first season. So that is very much the pot calling the kettle black right there. I'd be interested in going back through to find out how many people he actually murders versus how many people he backs into a corner that makes them either murder themselves or be murdered by someone close to them. I feel like he finds a way to just get other people to do it. Yeah, that's true. Like, you know, Sonny does all his own dirty work, so I can at least appreciate that. The next morning, we have the escort. murderer. (laughs) The next morning, we're finally going to get Lombard escorted to court. There's a big escort. They load him up on a couple of boats. They take him out from the middle of the water to the land. They have a train of cars bring them to their courthouse they bring them straight in the front door yeah, and this is so ridiculously over the top there's like 
15 people around them and they're doing the whole pulling the guns and pointing them at everybody in the courtroom. And, and we see that um, there's clearly a basement underneath the courthouse where they could have brought him down there. They, I mean, but then they wouldn't have been able to get the team all the different or all the same sweat jackets. And <laughs> hey, like as someone who has to help manage a T&E budget, you find ways. Okay. <laughs> that counts as a team outing. <laughs> the, those say lombard oh, yeah. lombard 85 and you could write all that off i mean it's just it's just a business expense they'll point. remember this forever yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean the, and they're really on edge i mean it's i liked it because it felt like like i was saying like it had a movie feel they were escorting him into the courthouse they were having him covered a couple of like italian looking guys come out of the out of the elevator and they surround Lombard and they pull their guns on the guys. They tell them to drop the bags. They go pat them down, find out that there's violins inside of their bags. And so like they're, they're on high edge, but I did want to ask the guys with the violins. How is that not suspicious that they're leaving the courthouse with a couple of, what were they doing there? What was happening at the courthouse with these guys in their violins? How do you not ask more questions? What were these Italian yes. guys doing at the courthouse with their violins? I mean, in, it feels like the vice team should do a more investigation as to who these guys are and why they were randomly bringing their violins to the courthouse. Yeah, yeah, that is just so strange. Were they playing for another courtroom? You know, like uh... <laughs> they're recording the lawn music. Out, at the end of this episode, this whole scene becomes absolutely pointless. So, yeah, and that's what um... makes this episode great. They walk into the court in their courtroom. It's empty except for Sal. So Al's son is there. They're totally empty, out of protection, and and Lombard's gonna, gonna take the stand. And the lawyer starts asking him some questions. And just when you think that Sal has convinced Lombard to 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 rat out Labrici, they're gonna go into witness protection. They're gonna live their lives again, but not as mobsters. What does Al do? Pleads the fifth. Yep. And John, yep. like you're saying, you, it was like Biggs. none of it. Ev- it was it was like this whole thing should have never happened. Yeah, dude. And I feel like there's a missed opportunity here because I feel like if they had included the son in the in the episode more that they could have been like he decides not to testify to kind of protect his son. Like I did it so that they wouldn't come after him. Now they'll come after me. Like I feel like there was an opportunity missed. Instead he pretty much just gives the finger to the entire Miami Vice the police department after they fed him, took him out on a boat. I do have some frustration with the ending, but I, I have frustration because I was locked into the story and it was like such a good twist at the end where he decides to plead the fifth because there's multiple reasons here why he pleads fifth. One is he says in the hallway with Tubbs and Crockett, but they have like this little laugh off. We're going to be always looking for each other in the future. You know, this is an ongoing battle between Crockett and Al Lombard, but also he says that it's Kinda not like in his Superman style. and Lex Luthor. He, yeah, it, but he says that it's also not in his style to rat people out. So he, so he wasn't going to do that. And then you also like, like his same with the son. If he rats out Labrici, then Labrici has a reason to go murder his entire family. You get that emotional ending where the son gets up and storms out of the courtroom and you realize Al's probably lost that relationship forever. So, like, I, I get it, but, like, I, I felt like there could have been more of a focus on that around that breaking of that relationship or the sacrifice of that relationship. The last scene that we have before this episode finally ends is that we just see Lombard. He makes bail because now he's going to go to jail for being in contempt but he posts bail and as he's leaving alone we see the two more of Labrici's men are going to tail him with massive guns and that's the end of the episode and that's the end of the first season yeah so really quick about that scene too so they go through all the guys and the matching windbreakers pointing guns at people in the courtroom to protect to getting him in the courtroom and Labrizi's guys are sitting outside the courtroom in a car with very big guns and nobody notices. Yep. So when all that coordination <laughs> just went right out the window. <laughs> well, let's get over and talk about the last two songs from season one of Miami Vice. All right, John, so what do you music, got for us this week? Because it seems like the music might be a little weak. It was extremely weak, which is very disappointing considering this is the last official music segment of season one. And I desperately was trying to find something to focus on. 
but I uh, I will start with Millie Small's 1964 song, My Boy Lollipop, which they play in the ice cream parlor. And the song was originally written by Robert Spencer of the doo-wop group The Cadillacs, in ni- and he wrote it for Barbie Gay, who performed it originally in 1956. So the little things about the song and Millie Small is that Millie Small is a Jamaican sing songwriter who after having a who after kind of hitting the scene in Jamaica a guy named Chris Blackwell would take notice of her and would actually become her manager and her legal guardian which I thought was kind of weird <laughs> weird weird yeah so then he would move her to London with him and Basically, they would. This would be the song that they would use to break out her career. The song would end up selling over six million records worldwide, and is basically known to kind of be the beginnings of mainstream reggae and ska music. Like, help where that came from. So that is that song because Millie Small would go on to have a somewhat successful career, but nothing that jumps off the page. The next song is Wire by U2 off the 1984 album The Unforgettable Fire. I just want to point out, YouTube has been around forever. I did not realize they've been a band since the 70s. It is oh, yeah. amazing how long they've been around and how little changes, if any changes, to the band's lineup. And that's what I wanted to focus on, talking about U2, because I feel like U2 is one of those bands that you should at least, you heard of U2. You should be familiar enough with at least some of their catalog. So I wanted to talk mostly about their beginnings. This song, Wire, it's it's like a B-side, deep track. Never, it, it wasn't a single. There was no real history behind this song. Yeah, and the album itself was their fourth studio album. There are two songs, The Unforgettable Fire and, God, I didn't write it down, but I think it's a song called Pride. Were the two main songs on the uh, on the album, so Wire wasn't even noticed compared to the other two songs on the album. So a little bit about the start of U2, the band, is that they formed in 1976 originally as a band called Feedback, because it was one of the only technical terms that they knew <laughs> uh, referring to music. <laughs> so that's the about band, the level of education I expected out of you two. And it makes sense because the band formed when they were classmates at the Mount Temple Comprehension School in Dublin, Ireland. The band was founded by drummer Larry Mullen Jr. And the band includes Paul Hewson, who is Bono, which, side note, I expected Bono to have a much more Irish last name than <laughs> Houston. <laughs> yeah. I was looking for, like, McCauley or something like that, or McCain, <laughs> and no, yeah. he's Paul Houston. So, and David Evans, the or The Edge, on guitars, and originally his brother Dick Evans on guitar as well. So, but I will get to him in a second. And then Adam Clayton on bass, and Dick Evans' friends, Ian McCormick and Peter Martin, were also in the band originally. Wow, that's a pretty big band. And also, John, I know that from history now, when you say, I'll get to him in a minute, it means one of two things. One, he was a like, flautist? Yeah, there's some crazy, he plays like some weird instrument or did something weird that's got got him kicked out of the van. Or two, we need to launch a 2020 investigation into his murder. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and you're kind of close. You're kind of close <laughs> with the first one. Because what I want to talk about is that when the band first formed as feedback, immediately within the first two weeks, Peter Martin and Ian McCormick quit the band. <laughs> so we don't even need to talk about them. <laughs> they weren't even around long enough for the first uh, practice session. So we crossed them off. In 1977, the band would change their name to The Hype. And so at this point, David Evans, a.k.a. The Edge, his older brother Dick had got, had started to go to college. And basically, everyone kind of felt he was the old guy in the group. And no one wanted them around anymore, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so they fired him in the most strangest way possible. In 1978, they held a farewell show at the Presbyterian Church Hall in Hoth, in which in the middle of the show, halfway through while they were performing as hype, Dick Evans would ceremoniously walk off the stage. And then the rest of the four-member band that would now be known as U2 would 
finish the show featuring their first original material. Oh, and weird. They would, what? And they would go on for the from then on to be the band known as U2, which is four members. And Dick Evans would leave the band to go on and join the band he founded around that same time, 1977, the Virgin Prunes, <laughs> which would be a band until 1984, but who cares? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and also found the band The Kid Sisters, who would become the Screeching Owls. So, so he went on what, to be... A mediocre musician. So, and to be honest with you, the Virginia Prunes actually originally started as a side project of Bono's as well. So, hmm. basically, Bono gave him his side project so that he would oh. leave the band. So that he would leave the band, and they made this big production at this church, and he would leave the band, and then they would become one of the biggest bands in the history of of uh, rock and roll, specifically biggest Irish bands. Mm. Oh yeah, and he would be nobody. <laughs> so that's just that's the that, level just, of shadiness I expect out of Bono, and I'm not going to hide the fact at all that I am not a U2 fan. No, I'm with I, you and on I that. have to admit, I kind of got that feeling reading that. Was that like like because they even make a comment about when the band originally formed, Larry Mullen Jr. had posted a flyer saying that he was trying to start a band and everyone that came out uh, and so that was when he gathered all Houston and David Evans and everybody came out to rehearse for the band came to uh, because they saw the flyer and he made a comment in an interview once saying that I originally pictured it as the Larry Mullins Jr. band mm -hmm. but I knew almost I knew within the first seconds of meeting Paul Houston that I was not going to be the person controlling the band. Mm -hmm. Like immediately he took control of everything. So yeah. And I just, that's got to suck to be Dick Evans, man. You know, <laughs> in the it, middle it's of your like set, those... say like, look, look, like you were great at doing cover songs, but we need you to not only not play in our original song, but get the fuck off the stage before we even perform our original song. <laughs> yes. Is he, and is keeping he gone? your brother as our guitarist. Yeah. <laughs> like your brother's cool, but we don't like you. <laughs> So, and I kind of feel like that's like when you talk to those people, like, you know, hey, back in the day, I could have invested in Google, but I didn't. Except mm -hmm. almost like, like, I try, this is almost like I tried to invest in Google, but they wouldn't take my money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't even let me stand in the back. I mean, yes. even the Beatles yeah. let Ringo be a part of the band. What would this other guy be just hanging out in the back playing a secondary guitar? He yeah, could play his flute. brother, his brother is still in the band today. He is still, like, he even has a cool nickname, The Edge, yeah. you know? I, I don't know. That's what I wanted to focus on was that Bono's kind of a dick. <laughs> um, you know, and I can't say anything about Ian McCormick or Peter Martin because they quit within the first two weeks, but they were both successful musicians in other bands. Dick Evans becomes the odd man out. And I'm sorry, <laughs> Dick. I really am. <laughs> and that's your music. Well, that's going to conclude the music for this last episode of my Let's get over to our final thoughts. So here we are, guys. This is the last episode of the first season. And I actually think I thought it was a great episode. Let's give our final thoughts on this episode. But remember, we are going to do a rundown of all of our favorite stuff from season one. Now that we're at the end here of season one, we're going to have a handful of episodes running down our favorite episode, our favorite guest stars, our favorite music, and then just a complete rundown of the first season. And I just want to plug real quick. I am going to be doing a Jan Hammer Music Spectacular <laughs> I'm very looking forward to doing. Jan deserves so. his own episode. Oh yes. Oh yeah. So there'll be everything. I'm going to have fireworks, a Viking funeral. <laughs> this is going to be awesome. <laughs> Well, John, why don't you give us your final thoughts on this on this episode, the last episode of season one, episode 23, titled Lombard. My thoughts are that I'm okay with this being the series finale. I, I was expecting a little 
more of a cliffhanger, but I can live with this. I feel like we got a little more time with a very good guest star, Dennis Farina, who we had seen before with a character that we knew, and it was a well-written episode. So I think we kind of got a nice ending to it. You know, nothing that just kind of blew me away, but I, I think it was a solid episode and a solid end of the season and forward to wh- wherever they're going to go with season two. Well, I do know for a fact, John, that season two, episode one, we're going to be in New York. Really? Yeah. Ooh. Jenna, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I thought it was a good episode. I really like Dennis Farina and I like the whole Lombard storyline. Like, even though we haven't seen Lombard consistently in all of the episodes, he's certainly been mentioned a number of times and he seems like a, a nice, like ever present nemesis for Sunny. So the story had a really good story and good characters but for me it just wasn't a season finale kind of kind of episode that felt much more like evan falls into that category yeah i mean just walking away from it i don't know if this episode gave me the kind of closure that i'm looking to get or any kind of cliffhanger or hints at what may be to come in the future except perhaps wondering whether or not lombard is finally gonna get the bullet with his name on it right but it was good it definitely an uh ending this the season on a strong note yeah and i'll say i really really enjoyed this episode and it was for all the reasons that why i love my advice we had a strong villain we had high action police. We had, as we laughed about throughout, you know, we had where Lombard gets away and there's some chase scenes. Everything that Miami Vice does well, they got in this episode, including some corny jokes with the B team. We had the high fashion. We had the bright colors. We had the rich, all the rich people in where Lombard's living on his yacht. He's talking about how he's going to divide up all his cars and his boat and all his money that he's made over the years to his cronies. And he's going to spread it out with his son. We had a relationship. We saw some behind the scenes relationship with Lombard and Sal and how he's just, even though he's a mobster, he's still just a regular guy and he loves his son. He wants to take care of his son. And then at the end of all of it, reminded that he's still a classic Italian gangster. So I think that this hit... The strong point of of what makes Miami Vice so great. Good direction, good story, high life, no drugs, but guns and action and high fashion and fast cars. It just hit everything on the right note. And it was it was less of a season ending of like we ended on a cliffhanger and this was the story that, to get to get you to come back and more of like a mini movie confirming to everyone exactly what Miami Vice is. Well, that's going to do it for this week on Go With The Heat, your enthusiast guide to the cultural phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This is the end of season one. We would love to he- we would love to hear feedback from you on what's your favorite episode, your favorite guest star, your favorite music that was from this season. Tweet at us and hashtag him GWTH for Go With The Heat. We'd love to hear what's your favorite episode or guest star or music or all three. What are your favorites? You can email us, GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Check out our website, GoWithTheHeat.com. Click on subscribe. Find all the ways you can find the show. iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, YouTube. We are available anywhere and everywhere you would like to listen. So that's going to do it for us this week. We're going to take a week off in preparation to get together what our favorites are from Season 1. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you in two weeks for the next episode of Go With The Heat. Bye, pals. Peace out.